Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand and greet each other with the sign of peace this morning. if this works. Is, can you hear me? No? Yes? Yeah, there we go. I'm fancy today. <laughs> the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. you may be seated. We've all been there. Our patience is gone. There's no energy left in the tank to cope with that conflict, that family member, this or that stress. What do I do when I'm at the end of my rope? Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Psalm 61, verses one and two. In the times we live in, it seems that it's easy to lose hope. We feel this in the times we live in, the world we live in. Where do we find hope when we're at the end of our rope? Let us pray. Gracious God, Sometimes we find ourselves in a place where we have nothing left and it's easy to lose hope. Restore us, lead us, and guide us when we're at the end of our rope. Amen. Trying to hold my breath, let it stay this way, can't let this moment end. You set off a dream in me, getting loud now, can you hear it echoing? Will you share this with me? Cause darling, without you All the shine 
of a thousand spotlights All the stars we steal from the night sky will never be enough Never be enough Towers of gold are still too little These hands could hold the world but it'll never be enough Never be enough for me never 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 for me for me never enough never enough never enough for me for me for me all the shine of a thousand spotlights All the stars we steal from the night sky Will never be enough Never be enough Towers of gold were still too little These hands could hold the world But it'll never be enough Never be enough for me Good morning. Guess who? A reading from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 9. 1 Kings captures Israel's roller coaster journey under kings and prophets. Amidst this backdrop, Elijah emerges as a beacon of God's power, challenged and artillery and promoted by King Ahab and his fierce wife Jezebel. After a fierce, fiery victory against Baal's prophets on Mount Carmel, Elijah is celebrating he's fleeing from Jezebel's death threats. This chapter shows us a vulnerable Elijah, reminding us that even the mist in faith have moments of weakness. But here's the heart of the story. Even in despair, God provides food, water, and rest. In Elijah's journey, we see a mirror of our own heights and lows, and a God who sustains us every step of the way. As Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah has done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword, then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by the morrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servants there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under the juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, it is not enough. Now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father. And as he laid and slept under the juniper tree, behold, the, then an angel touched him and said unto him, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was cake baked on the coals and cruse of water at his head. And he did eat and drink, and he laid down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose, and he did eat and drink, and went into the strength of the meat forty days and forty nights, unto Horeb, the mountain of God. This passage serves as a vivid reminder of God's provisions and understanding, even in our mountains of sheer exhaustion and despair. 
The great prophet Elijah, once a mighty force against the prophets of Baal, found himself fleeing in terror from Queen Je Jezebel's threats. But even in his most vulnerable state, God, in God's boundless mercy, sent an angel to minister to him, ensuring that he has both rest and sustenance. When you find yourself at the end of your rope, remember Elijah under the juniper tree. Take solace in the knowledge that our God, time and time again, offers a way out, a moment of rest and nourishment. We need to continue our journey. Word of God, life of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So what do you do when you have nothing left? A couple of weeks ago, I found myself in that position. There were all kinds of things going on in my life. I have a friend who I really love and care about who's going through a really, really tough time, and I found myself worrying about him just over and over and over again. Things here at church, they were really, really busy during that time, so I was putting in long days and long hours, and I would spend time on the phone with my daughter, Mackenzie, who had just graduated from college in Washington, D.C., and she was talking about moving back to Alexandria and, and how that was transition was going to be for her life from the big city living of D.C. to Alexandria. At the same time, my husband, Ryan, and uh, his company that he works for, they were doing what they called right-sizing, which meant that they were laying off people or demoting people. We didn't know what that meant for his position or for his team. My sister called that same week, and she was going through some stuff uh, with one of her daughters, and she was asking for my advice and wisdom, knowing that I have parented daughters before. 
I was worried about my nieces and all of those things, and I was tired, and I was overwhelmed by all of the things in the world. There was one day I had finished my week here at church, and I went and I got home, and uh, there were dirty dishes in the sink, and there was laundry all over the floor of the laundry room, and I found myself just crying, like, like disproportionately crying when I saw them. I mean, laundry and dishes, they exist in my life uh, all the time. I've been a mother for 26 years. There's always piles and piles of laundry and dishes. I call the laundry and dishes my nemesis that I sometimes have to go and attack. They're always there. But for whatever reason, this day, because I was overwhelmed, I cried. I cried and I cried over the laundry and dishes disproportionately because I was empty. I had nothing left. Uh, the truth was, is that I was at the end of my rope. I mean, you know when you're there. We all know when we're there. When we have a reaction that doesn't seem to match the situation that we're going through. Maybe you snap at one of your kids or your partner, or maybe you yell at your neighbor's dog as they walk across your lawn, or, or maybe the stress that you have about something, it just feels too much. So you're trying to control everything else in your life, or maybe you find yourselves looping in this anxious thought pattern where you are trying to work out how this scenario is going to go over and over and over again. You start overthinking it and overthinking it. We have these reactions that are disproportionate. A good friend of mine uh, during the pandemic went through a stressful time, a series of terrible, terrible losses. She lost three family members, not through COVID, but just from other things, and found herself with this grief that was overwhelming. At the same time, she did what everybody did when they had kids. Uh, they were homeschooling three kids at home. At the same time, her husband became obsessed with all the politics of the nation and all the things going on in the world after the 2020 election. Uh, and he was constantly listening to podcasts and news reports and then just reporting to her how bad everything was, how th terrible things were in the world. So meanwhile, she's got these grief, she's got these kids, she's got this politics, all of this around. And finally, it came the day when she broke. She just completely broke. Uh, as she describes it, she says, that day uh, the cheese slid off my cracker. That morning she was up until 4 a.m. trying to get the kids' laundry done and trying to get things organized for their homeschool the next day. But at 5 a.m. she just couldn't do it anymore, and so she texted her dad and asked him to come pick her up four hours away. To come pick me up. I can't do this anymore. I can't take anymore. I need you to come get me. And so her dad drove the four hours to go pick her up, and at 7 a.m. she dropped off the kids at her mother-in-law's. And unknown to her husband and her kids, she got in the car with her dad, and she left. We all have these things, these things in our lives that just like push us over. Sometimes they're big things like trauma and pain and health diagnosis and stress. But sometimes it's like death from a thousand paper cuts, all these little things like adding up over and over and over again until we finally get to the very, very end of ourselves. Sometimes uh, we don't even know if there's a rope to hold on to. Sometimes we're just falling and struggling and suffering, and we find ourselves with nothing left. Today we're in the second week of our sermon series, and here's our big question today. What do you do when you have nothing left? What do you do when you're at the very end of your rope, when you're at the end of yourself and your abilities and your tolerance and your frustration and your stress? You're at the end of your capacity. You're at the end of your power. You're at the end of your energy. You're just completely depleted. What do you do when you just can't take it anymore, when it all seems like it's just too much? I think we've all been there. Our partner frustrates us, our boss pushes us over the edge, the pressures of society, microaggressions, our kids, they just won't stop nagging us. The worry is too great, and it seems like it's just one thing after another after another, and we find ourselves exhausted and tired. Here's a quick question for you. Do you know who this woman is? You see, this woman is Rosa Parks, and in 1955 in Alabama, she decided not to give up her seat on a bus uh, to a white man, which started the Montgomery bus boycott. It was this huge movement in the United States Civil Rights Movement. Uh, later, after all the, the boycott was over, she was interviewed by a reporter, and the reporter asked her, just plainly, said, Rosa, why didn't you give up your seat on the bus? 
And she sat there, and uh, the reporter kept pushing. She says, was it planned? Was it this big act of bravery? And Rosa looked at the reporter, and she said just really honestly, she said, no, I was just tired. She was tired, and that kind of tired, that kind of stress, that kind of injustice, that kind of mental load and oppression, that kind of tired that is just in your bones where you just can't anymore. You see, she was at the end of her rope. Let's be honest, uh, in our culture, we're taught that if we find ourselves stressed, pressed, or just a mess, that it's up to us to pull ourselves out of it. Like, like follow these five steps and you'll pull yourself back together. Or take my master class on how how to learn not to get into this big giant mess in the first place. Or or hustle, or, or get your stuff together, or work harder, or work more, go get it done, go, 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 get it done faster. When my oldest son, Chase, uh, was growing up, he played soccer. And as he was growing up, he, one evening we went over to the soccer field and we went uh, up to the field that he was gonna play on and inside this net was this huge owl looking at us. Evidently it was flying, trying to probably get a mouse or something and then it crashed into the net and it got stuck and it was hustling and moving and around and it got more and more angry. And even after we called the DNR and they came and they were trying to put their big gloves on and clip the, the little ropes away from this big giant owl, it kept trying to claw and bite at the guy who's trying to set it free. You see, I think this is what we do to ourselves. We try and work through our stresses and our messes all on our own, but what ends up happening is that we just keep getting wrapped up tighter and tighter and tighter. And so it's no wonder that we're worn out. It's no wonder that we're tired. It's no wonder that at the end of it, we are the most medicated, in debt, overweight, anxious, depressed society that has ever existed in human history. Studies show that in our country, people are living longer, but people are living sicker. Yeah, we might get 80, 90, 100 years out of our lives, but we're not living healthier lives than generations before us. Instead, we're living with uh, heart disease and cancer and anxiety and addiction, which are caused mostly by stress or reactions from stress or how we choose to deal with that stress. Friends, this is not the life that God wants for us. So we can't just keep doing what we are doing because it is not working. So what do we do instead? So there's this great story in the Old Testament. It's actually one of my very favorite stories in all of the Old Testament. It's about the prophet Elijah. Now Elijah, he's sent to go prophesy to this really bad king of Israel, King Ahab, and then his even worse wife, uh, Queen Jezebel. Now here's the thing about prophets. We tend to think that prophets, they go and they are predicting the future. Like they're telling you what's gonna happen in the future. But really what they do is they name the injustices of the world. They name what's going on in society and they call out the patterns that are gonna eventually lead to destruction. They sit there and say, you know, look at all these things that are happening. If you don't turn from your ways, then then this is probably what the result is gonna be. It's kind of like doctors in our modern age. If you don't take care of yourself now, 10 years down the line, you're gonna end up struggling with X, Y, and Z. It's not that they can predict the future, but they can just sort of tell and kind of cast vision on what's gonna happen. So Elijah, the prophet, is sent to the evil King Ahab and his even worse Queen Jezebel. And the problem that they are experiencing is is that they've chosen not to worship God, not to worship the God of Israel, not to worship our God. Instead, they're gonna worship uh, Jezebel's God. Jezebel's God, which is this idol called Baal. And eventually through Elijah, there's this showdown between Baal and God, and of course, God wins on top of Mount Carmel. It's this whole big celebration. But then Jezebel, she ends up going out in this like murderous rage, and she sends this message to Elijah that says very specifically, says, I am going to have you killed. And then this is what happens. Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he went a day's journey into the wilderness and he came to a broom bush and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. You see, here's Elijah. He's running, running out into the wilderness. He's running for his life. His adrenaline is going, but then he finds himself exhausted 
finds himself exhausted and discouraged, emotionally spent, afraid for his life, to the point where he says, God, I just can't take it. God, I just can't take it anymore. God, just let me die. I don't want to do this anymore. Just kill me now and get it over with. But then here's what happens. Then he laid down under this bush, and then he fell asleep. And all at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some baked bread over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then laid down again. What does God do for Elijah when Elijah has nothing left? He says, take a nap. (laughs) Take a nap. Rest, eat, and then repeat. Do that again. Rest, eat, repeat. This is what you are to do when you have nothing left. But get this. 70% of Americans don't get enough sleep. The average American gets less than seven hours per night, and 50 to 70 million Americans have sleep disorders. Or these facts about what we eat. 90% of Americans don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. Two-thirds of American adults are overweight, and 900 Americans die each day from diet-related deaths. You see, we keep hustling. We keep hustling and working, and the net, it just keeps getting tighter and tighter and tighter. We're trying to free ourselves from this mess, all this striving and hustling. But let's be honest for a second. It's not working. We're not sleeping. We're not eating well. So what does God say to you when you are empty? What does God say to you when you have nothing left? What does God say to you when you're out at the end of your rope? Same thing God says to Elijah. God says, Rest, eat, repeat, rest, eat, repeat. Just just do that. Take care of yourself. Well, my friend uh, got picked up by her dad, and, and they were driving back to her dad's house. She called her husband, and, and she was weeping. And she told him all the things that she had kept inside during all of those really stressful months. And, and she said, I, I left the kids with your mom, and I, d- I need a break. I need to take a break. And it all came crying out. And she just confessed to him that she couldn't do it anymore, and that she felt like she was a failure as a wife and a mom, and she needed a break. And get this, when she got to her dad's, she, she went to bed, and she slept for 16 hours straight. 16 hours. That kind of bone tired of exhaustion. And then after that, she got up, and, and her dad had made her some food, so she ate some healthy food and, and then made an appointment with the therapist and the doctor. And after a long talk with her husband, and over time, things got a lot better. But she needed to be cared for when she was that broken down. Rest, eat, repeat. It seems so simple, but it's like the hardest thing that we ever have to do, isn't it? It seems like it's such a simple solution to our burnout and to our exhaustion, but it's so hard for us to do. Psalm 46.10 is one of my very favorite verses in the Bible. You see it all the time on T-shirts or coffee mugs or water bottle stickers. You see it on little plaques in people's houses. It's one of my favorites. I used it at my ordination, and uh, I tell it to my kids when I see that they are upset. I'm sure that you have probably heard it. It says, be still and know that I am God. But there's something really interesting about this particular Bible verse. This first part, this be still, it's actually the Hebrew word rafa, which is actually better translated from be still instead to cease striving and know that I am God. That's so hard for us though, isn't it? (laughs) To quit striving, to quit trying to do all the things we think that are expected of us in this world. It's so hard for us trying to quit to go out there and try and do all the things on our own. It's hard for us to take time to rest. When my kids were toddlers, uh, my husband and I, we would be hanging out with friends or something, and uh, we would watch the kids to see when they would get on that tipping point of being really tired. You guys know what that's like if you've ever had a toddler. And we do this little gesture from across the room uh, of kind of like an airplane, meaning that it was time for us to sort of wrap up what we were doing and go home and put the toddlers to bed. Uh, The airplane for us, it symbolized uh, what happens when you have a tired toddler. Um, Sometimes uh, it's like running a plane that has no gas. Sometimes you can land it, but then other times it just crashes (laughs) into the side of the mountain. 
uh, when my kids were toddlers, they fought sleep. They fought sleep with their whole beings. They fought rest, and if they were really, really tired, then they kind of doubled down and fought it even more. They didn't want to stop, and, and sometimes what I'd have to do is take my little toddlers, and I'd have, to, I'd have to hold them really tight and just sing to them just to get their little bodies to relax for a second. Because I, their mom, I knew what they needed. I, as their mom, I knew that they needed to rest and to slow down, that tomorrow was going to be a better day if they got the rest that they needed. And friends, God knows what you really need. Cease striving and know that I am God. Not that, that you are God. Cease striving and know that God is God. God says, quit fighting me on this. Quit fighting me on this. Let me hold you. Let me have you. I know your story. I'll catch you when you're falling. I'll be there when you're a mess. Oh, I've got your purpose and I've named your identity. I've got good work for you to do. But rah, that's later. Right now, I want you to rest. I want you to let go. I want you to cease striving because I've got you. I got you. Rest, eat, repeat. You see, God is consistent. God is loving. God is for you. Jesus meant it with his whole body when Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Rest, eat, repeat. My friends, the truth is, is God's got you even if, even if your mental health derails and even if you burn out, even if you can't take it anymore, even if you are so overwhelmed, even if you are just so tired, God's got you even if you find yourself feeling numb or if the burden feels too heavy or even if you feel like you're going under or even if you don't know where to go. My friends, God's got you even if you're crying in the bathroom or even if you're lost or even if you're angry or even if you're burned out. God has got you even if you are all the way at the end of your rope. And God says to you, oh, my child, Oh, my darling, oh, my beloved, what's got you so stressed out? Let me take care of that. Rest, I got you. What's got you so worried? Oh, let me worry about that. Rest, I got that covered too. Oh, my child, where are you barely hanging on? Rest, let go, I've got you. I love when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But even better yet, in the message translation by Eugene Peterson, it says, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and God's rule. Before Elijah, it took 40 days. 40 days and nights out there in the wilderness being cared for by God. Elijah's job for 40 days to eat, rest, and repeat. This is all he did for 40 days because that's what he needed. He needed to know that God had him in and through all of it. And you see, here's the beautiful thing. The end of yourself is the beginning of God. The end of your abilities is the beginning of God's abilities. The end of your ways, your works, and your will is the beginning of God's ways, God's works, and God's will. So what do you do when you have nothing left? What do you do when you're at the end of your rope? Just let go. Cease striving, because God has got you. God will provide for you, because God loves you so, so much. Rest, eat, repeat. Amen. Close my eyes and I can see a world that's waiting up for me that I call my home. Through the dark, through the door, through when no one 
it's been before, but it feels like home. They can say, they can say it all sounds crazy. They can say, they can say I've lost my mind. I don't care, I don't care, so call me crazy. We can live in a world that we desire. Cause every night.
gracious God, at the end of our rope, you provide in our gifts, small and great. May we reflect in your boundless generosity, transform these offerings into hope, reaching those in need and proclaiming your never ending grace. In Christ's name we pray. Let us pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us in song. May the God of hope fill you with all the joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope.
Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.